Hello and welcome to what could be the first in a series of recorded video presentations from Commonweal. I am Dr Craig DL, the Head of Policy and Research at Commonweal, and those who know me know that for the past several years my work has involved travelling around Scotland, going to various campaign groups, going to public events, um, for example Yes groups, Commonweal local groups and various political party meetings to discuss Commonweal's policies. Um, due to the recent COVID-19 outbreak, however, these public events have been sharply curtailed. So, I've taken the decision that instead of going to a meeting tonight, I'm going to record the presentation that I was going to give, and we're going to throw it up online, we're going to have a virtual presentation, and I'm going to have a Q&A afterwards with the folk who have watched it. If this proves popular, we may go back through some of my other regular talks and record them and present them as well. So tonight, we're going to talk about Commonweal's plan for a Green New Deal for Scotland, our common home. I'm going to discuss the origins of the, the need for this policy, the climate emergency, the challenges that are coming to Scotland if we do not deal with the imminent problems, why Scotland can succeed at this uh, task and fixing the problems that are coming, and what we need to change and what we need to do about them. So... We know about the climate emergency. We've known about the, the imminent problems of global warming for decades now, but we know just how bad it is getting. In 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change produced a report saying that there was no more time for debate and delay. We must limit global warming to below 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels, and we must make serious efforts to start decarbonising our economy within 12 years or we will hit fundamental tipping points that means that the task will become impossible. That was two years ago. We have 10 years left. The clock is ticking. The impact of missing these targets is severe. Considering sea level rise alone, even at 1.5 degrees we're seeing significant sea level rise of between half a metre and three metres. This is important to understand. Even at 1.5 degrees, we're seeing significant impacts of global warming. 1.5 degrees isn't a safe ceiling. They actually said something like 0.5 degrees was the safe ceiling. We're currently at 1.1 degrees, so we're already beyond safe. We're now in damage control. If we go to the upper limit that the IPCC was recommending, which was 2 degrees, then we're seeing sea level rises of up to 6 metres. And if we carry on doing nothing and just following the policies that we're already doing, then we're projecting a four degree rise or more. We are looking at entire cities disappearing here, folks. We're looking at places like Alexandria, Osaka, Miami disappearing. We're looking at countries disappearing. The island nations of the Pacific, countries like Bangladesh, hundreds of millions of people face being displaced if we do nothing. And what do we do when that happens? Where do these people go? Scotland is not immune from all of this. This is a map produced by the Surging Seas uh, website. Very. This shows projections for Falkirk by 2100. On the left we have the 1.5 degree ceiling. On the right we have the 2 degree ceiling. Falkirk may well be significantly affected by climate change, even if we meet our targets. Other cities like Inverness, Aberdeen, parts of Greenock, Glasgow will be significantly affected. One of the great ironies is that Glasgow Airport looks set to go underwater within the next hundred years. There is no more time for delay in this. This was the, the, the firm point about the IPCC, but it's also the point that we really need to take to heart when we start making excuses. Like, well, we need to wait for everybody else to take a step before we take a step. Because here's the truth of it. 50% of the global carbon emissions are caused by the richest 10% of people on Earth. That's us. We are in that box. This is our problem to fix. And sitting around waiting for everybody else to take that first step before we do something, well, that kind of multilateralism is working as well for the climate change movement as it has been for the nuclear disarmament movement. Excuses like we're too small no longer cut it when we are disproportionately part of the problem. This one is on us. And anyway, there is this national story that Scotland has that Scotland invented the world as part of the, industrial, the first industrial revolution. 
There's a fair bit about romanticism and jingoism about that, but let's take that story at its face. If we did that before, why can't we do it again? Why are we just abandoning the world when we could be leading the way? We could be developing the solutions. We could help others develop the solutions. We could export the skills and the technology to help others fix the problems because this is a global problem. Even if we're not waiting for the rest of the world to catch up, we caused it. It's our responsibility to take a part in fixing it. It's our responsibility to help others fix it as well. Now, here's the thing with the environmental movement as a whole. This isn't just a problem of decarbonisation. Climate isn't even the only emergency that we're facing. We've seen those nature documentaries of the plastic choking our seas, our land, our own bodies. There may well be nowhere left on the earth that is not polluted by plastic now, and the problem is getting worse. We are losing species of animals and plants at a horrific rate. How many of you out there will remember driving in rural areas and when you got home you had to scrape all the insects off your, your windscreen? How many of you remember when that stopped? Since about the year 2000, Europe is estimated to have lost around 80% of its insect biomass. 80% of the insects are dead. One in six bee species are regionally extinct somewhere. If we lose the pollinators, we lose everything else, including us. Critical resources are depleting, people are fighting over what's left, soils are eroding, water sources are polluting, aquifers are depleting, we are overstressing this planet, people are fighting over what's left. So a Green New Deal will be tackling decarbonisation, but it also has to tackle all of these other things as well. So what does this mean for Scotland? Let's start with the great black elephant, oil, because there is a great argument that goes around, especially the independence movements, that says what we really need to do is get independence, then drill out all of the oil we can get, every last drop, sell it for as much money as we can, become as rich as Norway, and then we can fix everything else. I highly recommend you go and read this paper that I'm showing uh, from Friends of the Earth Scotland called Sea Change that looks at the problem with this thinking, but also looks at the opportunities that if we get away from that, we can create a much better economy. Here's the science, folks. Think about all the oil around Scotland that we don't know about yet. All those fields that we haven't discovered or those fields that we suspect might be there, but, you know, folk have stopped us going looking. There's a great myth or a great story about all that oil off the West Coast that the Ministry of Defence has blocked Scotland from looking at. All of that oil in the unknown fields has to stay in the ground if we want to meet our 1.5 degree target. Now think about all those oil reserves that we know about, we know they're there, but we haven't started tapping them yet. 100%, every last drop of that oil has to stay in the ground if we want to meet our 1.5 degree target. And of the oil in reserves that we're currently extracting, at least 20% of that has to stay in the ground if we want to meet our target. So that's the challenge. That's the science of it. There's no getting around this. But let's say we don't. Let's say we go after every last drop. We're doing our own economy a disservice when we do this. The paper also states that around five times as many jobs could be created in the offshore renewable industry if we push for that instead. The jobs are highly transferable. Who knows offshore engineering better than a rigger, really? And I've actually had direct industrial experience of this when I've spoken to folk who are doing this. I've spoken to folk in offshore renewable companies who are hiring riggers and saying we're really starting to scare the oil industry at the rate we're taking the skills from them. There are great opportunities if we do this right. So let's look at what a Green New Deal would mean for Scotland. The first thing to look at is electricity. Because if we really want to focus on renewable electricity instead of oil-based energy, we're going to have to build up the national grid. And right now, the national grid uh, severely disadvantages the development of Scottish renewables. It has been reported somewhere that this is a direct conspiracy. It's not really. It's just that the UK network is designed for a previous age. It's designed for the coal age. Back then, what you wanted to do was minimise your transmission losses. Electricity was expensive to transport. Coal was cheap to transport. It transports very well by rail. 
So what you did was you built your coal power plants near to your population centres. That's London in the southeast. So you set up your grid to encourage this via a system of charges and subsidies. Upshot of this, if you stick a one megawatt generator in the centre of London, you'll be paid a transmission subsidy of £8,000 a year to connect that generator to the national grid. Put the same turbine in Caithness, you will pay a tariff of 24000 So we are now in the age where we can not we can move coal by train, but we can't move the wind. We need to put the generators where the resources are. But right now the system is working against us. So one of the first jobs of a Green New Deal Scotland is to nationalise the energy grid, nationalise the means of production of energy, and start developing a grid that works for the 21st century and the renewable age. Now, to be fair, this is one of the areas that we will need to wait for independence to do. A lot of these powers are reserved, but we can get the groundwork done. And we can start working out exactly what we would do when those powers are coming. This is not the case for the next area. Housing. Especially new housing. We're still building crap housing. 95% of our heating budget in Scotland is heated with fossil fuels. We're still building houses that rely on fossil fuels. Although, you know, to be fair, the installation of new gas boilers is going to get phased out in the next couple of years. But that doesn't fix the problem of cold houses. Many of you out there will have monthly heating bills of 50 quid a month or maybe even £100 a month. We need to start building eco-houses. And we need to start recognising that if we are moving towards a Green New Deal future, then we have to start building the houses and the other buildings now that will be compatible with that future. If we want a zero carbon Scotland in 2045, which is the current Scottish Government plan, we need to recognise that a house built today will still be standing in 2045, therefore should be built to Green New Deal standards. Or we're going to build up a massive problem of retrofits. We already have a large problem with retrofits and every house, every building we construct today that will need retrofitted tomorrow is adding to that problem. This is something the Scottish Government could fix now. It simply needs to change building regulations and planning regulations to say that from now, all buildings will meet zero carbon passive heating standards. The picture on the slide here is an example of a tenement in Edinburgh that is built to passive house standards. These passive houses are incredibly efficient. This house here actually doesn't have central heating. The only heater inside the, the flats here is the towel rail in the bathroom. Just the waste heat from things like the washing machines and the general utilities keeps the place warm. This is not magic technology. These houses do not cost much more to build than building to conventional standards. It simply needs a cultural shift within the industry and regulations to push standards up. And we're going to be showing a paper um, from Commonwealth very, very soon that will show exactly how we can fund this using things like the National Investment Bank, a national infrastructure company, and working with local authorities. Now, I mentioned existing buildings and retrofitting. The fact is that of the, all the houses in Scotland right now, 80% of them will still be standing in 2045 when we need to be at zero carbon Green New Deal standards, and almost none of those houses are currently at those standards. This was the single largest task in our Green New Deal plan. It's the one that will take the longest, it's the one that involves the most labour, it's the one that is the most expensive, but it's also the most important. We need to be going round houses and retrofitting radically. The slide there shows an example of what that could look like based on a house down in England that was retrofitted up to passive energy standards. Involves a new jacket on the outside of the house, better insulation, quite some radical changes, and it, but it pays dividends once you do it. Again, this is something that we need to get started on. We need to start training up the engineers and the builders to do this job because we are going to need a lot of feet to fill the boots on the ground. We need to start working out where the houses are. Right now, the Scottish Government's approach is quite lazy, quite backwards. It's saying that every house should be increase to EPC level efficiency C by 2030 and then EPC B by 2040. Think about that for a moment. I currently live in a band D house. Does that mean that by 2030 I, I will have to have my house retrofitted up to band C and then I'll need a second visit in, in 2040 to get it up to band B? Why not instead start going round the housing stock of Scotland and working out what houses can be retrofitted to? 
Not every house will make it up to passive energy standards, especially some of the older ones, especially some of the houses, especially in rural areas where you've got older buildings and you've got non-standard construction. It's going to be hard to do. But also think about the cities as well, where you have a lot of buildings that may not be in very good repair. And maybe, again, older tenements might have trouble getting up to the standard. But what we need to do is go around every single building work out what it can be retrofitted to, and instead of saying, right, get up to this band by then and this band by thereafter, just work out, this is what it can get to, this is the maximum technically feasible efficiency level we can retrofit in this building, put it up to that straight away. So if my house can be retrofitted up to band A, let's do it. Instead of having two visits, I get one visit from engineers and the job's done, and I don't need to worry about that anymore. I mentioned fossil fuel heating, and this is the second biggest line in the Green New Deal. We really need to stop burning oil and gas for heating. Only 5% of non-electrical heat is currently renewable. And electrical heat as itself is very expensive. There are multiple ways that we could do this, and multiple suggestions being put forward for this. One is that we simply take out every gas boiler and replace it with air source heat pumps. This is the, the kind of private company-led version of this. It's really good for private companies, especially those private energy suppliers who are supplying renewable electricity, turn all gas customers into electrical customers. And I'm not knocking air source heat pumps in general. They can be very efficient. They can have their place. They're certainly much more efficient than electric convention heaters. But there is an even better way to do it if we bite the bullet and decide to spend money on infrastructure as well. Air source heat pumps are what you do if you don't want to put in pipe. If you, want, if you are willing to start upgrading infrastructure, then we can do things even more efficiently. The plan that we are proposing in the Common Home Plan is a network of district heating rings. These are common around Europe. Almost unknown in the, in the UK, although there are a couple of uh, demonstrator uh, district heating systems, one up in Inverurie, for instance. The way these things work is we're used to having the fuel for our heating systems delivered via electricity or for gas. And we're used to other utilities like water being delivered to us. Why not, instead of delivering the fuel for our heating system, just, de just deliver the heat? So have a ring of heat pipes around your community that then feed into your houses, and these feed back to central generators. Instead of 100 small boilers, you have one large one. Immediately you make efficiency savings when you do this. The other major advantage of district heating is future-proofing. Think about it this way. If we put in air source heat pumps everywhere and we put everyone on electrical heating, that may be efficient. That may be a bit cheaper than what we've got right now. But what happens when future technology comes along that presents an even cheaper solution that makes electricity look expensive? Well, what you've done is you've locked everyone into electricity. And the same goes for proposals for changing natural gas to hydrogen. Hydrogen is currently an extremely expensive form of heating and is likely to remain so. If you put everyone in a hydrogen heating economy, then you lock out all of the other options. So if solar thermal or geothermal or any other form of heating becomes much more cheap to produce, people can't take advantage of it. With a district heating system, however, the delivery system doesn't really care where the heat comes from. Once your pipes are in serving the houses, go back to the generator side, you can plug in solar thermal, you can plug in geothermal, you can plug in hydrogen burners, you can plug in renewable electricity. You can change the system to suit whatever is required and whatever is most efficient. It's a lot of work. This is an infrastructure program that probably exceeds the change from town gas to natural gas back in the 60s and 70s, a bit before my time, I'll admit. But once it's in, these pipes can last for decades or centuries. Once we have set up this system, we future-proof ourselves for whatever comes at us after that in a way that no other option does. It's a lot of work at the start, but it pays off. So what would a heat budget look like? Scotland could be largely heated by the sun. Yes, really. I mean it. We looked at the, the numbers on this. Large fields of solar thermal panels could be used to heat up reservoirs of water, which could then store the, the heat 
from the summer when most of that heat will be generated into the winter when it's mostly needed. In areas of Scotland, especially in the central belt, we have the potential of geothermal energy, especially from the legacy of our coal mining past. A lot of these coal mines underneath, say, Glasgow uh, have been abandoned and are flooded, but that water has been warmed by the earth. That heat can be extracted. They reckon about 40% of Glasgow could be heated through geothermal alone. In rural areas, it's a bit harder to get district heat and pipes out. Not impossible, but it is more expensive and it is a bit harder. So for very rural areas, you might still be looking at individual boilers. You might still be looking at things like biomass burners, biogas or renewable electricity. And there will be a place for hydrogen as well. Hydrogen can be stored when you have excess renewable electricity and then used when you have maybe your energy storage is getting a bit low during the winter or in the morning when everyone's got their kettles on and their showers running, you can top up the, the peak demand through hydrogen. So that's heat. Let's now look at some of the other chapters in the Common Home Plan. Food. I mentioned at the start that climate wasn't the only emergency we were facing. We we're also looking at problems of water supply. We're looking at soil erosion. We are potentially looking at the breakdown of global trade. We're seeing right now with the, the coronavirus pandemic just how fragile our global system of trade is. It may be in a climate emergency we could lose access to key products that we take for granted at the, ne at the moment. Food is one of humanity's great success stories, especially in the last century. The farming techniques and improvements over the 20th and 21st century have allowed us to triple yields per hectare. Something like a billion people are alive today who would not be alive today had it not been for the Green Revolution of the 1960s and pioneers like Norman Borlaug. But it has come at a cost. The mass use of intensive agriculture, of intensive chemical fertilizers has caused a great deal of environmental damage, both on the soil itself and the chemical runoff from these fields into the oceans. So we need to move to a system of agroecology, of growing food in a way that does not harm the planet and is sustainable well into the future. Scotland could pioneer a lot of these techniques. Scotland already is pioneering techniques to do with things like permaculture and other forms of agroecology, no-till farming, that sort of thing. We can also look at technology as well. We could look at things like indoor farming, bring farms into the cities, into warehouses. One, this allows you to very carefully monitor and control climate in a way that you can't do outdoors. And in an era where climate change may mean more unpredictable climate and uh, weather, this could become important. It also allows us to shorten supply chains. What we used to fly in at massive CO2 carbon footprints, we can grow right next door. We can also increase yields even further by going vertical. Instead of talking about how many calories can you grow on a square meter of area, you start talking about how many calories you can grow in a cubic meter of volume. Again, there are pioneers, even in Scotland, of this kind of indoor farming. There's a company up in Dundee that's doing this. Shortening those food supply chains also has advantages in other sectors. For example, transport. Transport is another major source of emissions. Around 25% of the energy we use in Scotland is for transport, fuel for cars and trucks and buses and whatnot. 37% of Scotland's carbon footprint comes from transport. So not just reducing supply chains and trade, we need to start thinking about ways to do things differently, ways to move our people around as well. We need to work better, work closer to home to reduce those commutes. I I often commute into, into Glasgow for work and often caught in traffic jams. It's miserable. Why are we doing this? I can't, I'm actually lucky. I can work from home. And during this pandemic, I'm, you know, a lot more people are realizing they can too. I actually wonder if after this crisis is all over, some people might decide that finding a better work life balance that involves more homework could become a, a thing. And I really hope it does. It doesn't suit everybody, it doesn't suit every job. Before I was in politics, some of you know I worked in the, the laser industry. I couldn't set up a clean room in my shed and build lasers from home. It's not going to work that way. But for a lot of workers, a lot of the time, I could see advantages in this. Take just a few percent of cars off the road to do with the morning commute and those traffic jams disappear. Take a few more percent off by increasing public transport 
and suddenly life becomes a lot more pleasant. There are some unknowns here. We don't yet know the impact of things like automation, like this wee Google car. Um, I actually have a good anecdote about this. I, in my old job, I was out in uh, California installing a laser and I saw one of these cars very much like this making a turn across a dual carriageway across five lanes of traffic with both the both people in the car, the, the, the pilot and the co-pilot, both hanging out of the car, both hands in the air, waving at everyone going by. Hilarious to watch. And the car made the turn perfectly. We don't yet know how far automation is going to go or how it's going to change our relationship with cars. If what we do is keep all of our individual cars, keep our commuting patterns, but all we do is tra transfer from internal combustion to electric, then we might solve the decarbonisation problem but we increase the problem of resources for building batteries. We still have our morning commute traffic jam. And we have a, a bigger problem of where do we charge all these cars? Charging an electric car at home is great if you have your own driveway. I don't. I live in quite a narrow street. Car parking is already at a premium. If you start installing charging stations everywhere, we're going to have even more trouble parking our cars. And if you're in a wheelchair, you're not getting down the pavement anymore. So we need to seriously consider what we're doing with that push as well. If we automate all of our cars and we get rid of the idea of privately owning a car and all we do is phone up uh, uh, an automated taxi whenever we need it, then those charging stations can be out of town in a car park. But even here, there's a choice. What we should do is have a national public transport company that owns not just the trains, not just the buses, but start looking at the taxis as well. Our utopian vision for this is empty roads, a few automated taxis, mass public transport, and quite a pleasant living environment. The dystopian version? Your traffic jam is sponsored by RoboUber. While you're in this traffic jam, we're going to feed you as many adverts as we can. That doesn't seem like a very nice solution to me, even if it does get us away from the climate emergency. Next chapter is on land. Scotland has a real problem with land and land ownership. Some 50% of Scotland is owned by around 450 people. Almost 20% of Scotland is used for grouse hunting. 4% of Scotland is burned to support that industry. 300,000 hectares of Scotland is deliberately set fire to to support the shooting industry. These are figures from our sister campaign over at revive.scot. They've got some really good papers on how we can change the, the way we approach our rural land. We've estimated that you can do almost anything with this kind of land other than hunting and you would get a better economic impact and you get a better environmental impact. And that includes, by the way, doing nothing, just letting the land go wild again. We also need to think about the land in other places. Not just a rural issue, this is an intensely urban issue as well. Look around your cities, look around your communities. Every single community I've ever visited has been able to give me an example of that derelict building that has been had nothing done to it for decades and is just sitting rotting. We need to have a really hard conversation about what it means to own land and own buildings around us. And if people are not making the maximum use of what they own, then we need to start looking at ways that we can, we can make that happen. And now we think about what we are doing as individuals. Our consumerist economy, our society of fast fashion, buy more widgets, buy more crap, throw it away, upgrade to the next crap, just consume, consume, consume. This is not a way to run an economy. And it's essentially the way we have caused a great deal of the damage that we're seeing around us. All of these resources being dug up, produced into stuff that is then thrown away after one use or sometimes not even that. How many of you have been given one of those presents at Christmas? You unwrap it and you look at it, you go, ha, 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 very funny, and you throw it away immediately. All, all of the utility in that was for one joke as soon as you opened it. Probably the worst example I've ever seen of this was a couple of years ago, um, Poundland produced a, a Valentine's gift called the Box of Nothing. What do you want for Valentine's Day, no, uh, honey? Oh, nothing. Okay, here's an empty clamshell box. It's not even recyclable. That's appalling. 
We cannot keep producing goods like this. We cannot keep producing goods that when one component in them breaks, you have to chuck them away and upgrade them. It's good to see the EU is starting to get onto the right to repair movement, for instance, and is starting to mandate that not only have you the right to send a product back and get it repaired, but goods have to be designed to be more easily repaired. For example, by reducing the use of custom components like screws, with very specialised nibs on them that make it impossible for anyone else to open them up and repair them. We need to start designing our products from the beginning to fit into a circular economy. And we don't just mean buy, use, recycle. If that's all you're doing, that's actually, a sense, in a sense, a form of failure. We should be looking at multiple loops, multiple uses of resources. Once we dig up resources and turn them into a thing, that thing, the resources embedded in it, should stay in our economic system for as long as possible before it becomes waste. And ideally, it should not become waste. So we've proposed a multiple loop system. The first one being borrow. Why are we all buying the same tools that sit in a drawer not being used when we could have a tool library and just borrow what we need when we need it? Why are we not seeing more in the way of clothes libraries, especially baby clothes libraries? Because we all know how fast they grow. But also things like formal wear. Why not have a design competition in Scotland, get some young Scottish designers, design the next season of clothing. That then appears in the, the clothes library. You can borrow it for formal events. My dream for a Green New Deal Scotland is everyone stoking about in designer wear and we didn't have to buy any of it. The next loop, if we're not talking about borrowing, we're talking about reusing. We're getting quite good at thinking this way with things like reusable carrier bags, reusable coffee cups. Design more things to have more uses embedded in them. Then we get on to repair cycle, the, that repair and reuse. Our washing machines shouldn't be thrown away when one component breaks. We should be having more in the way of jobs created, a local repair person who can come around and fix all your, all your gadgets and utilities. Then think about remanufacture. So say my laptop hits the point where it can't really be repaired anymore. Or maybe it just gets too old and I want to upgrade the hardware in it. So what I should do is take it back to the shop and strip out everything that can be stripped out, what needs to be stripped out, but preserve everything that can be preserved. Just because the motherboard is dead doesn't mean I replace the keyboard. Design all of our products to be much more modular in this sense. Then, once we get to the point of products breaking down to the point where they can't be reused, as much as possible of it should be compostable. So more bioplastics, for instance. Anything that cannot be put in the home composting bin should be able to be taken to a community composting bin or an industrial composter. Only then should we look at recovering those resources that are beyond use, and cannot be composted, but can be broken down and recycled. Anything that cannot fit into this cycle shouldn't be used at all. So when do we want to do all this back? It was quite interesting during the December 2019 general election, where you saw a lot of the, a lot of the political parties outbidding each other on decarbonisation targets. The UK government wanted to do it by 2050. Scottish government says 2045. Other groups have said 2040, 2035. Here's the thing, all of these are targets without a plan. None of them have a, a stated roadmap of how we get from where we are now to how we get to where we are then. All of these plans, no better than political slogans. And I, I even include the folk who want to go faster in this. If you want to go faster, we need to show how we can do it. Commonweal took a different approach. What we said was, Let's look at what we need to do, how fast we think we can do it. We think it will take about 25 years to, to implement our plan, largely because of the big infrastructure projects like the housing restructuring and the district heating pipes. But I'm quite happy to say if you think we can do it faster, then please send us a blueprint. We, we really want to engage on this. We really want to show how things can be sped up and to do this as quickly as possible. The key point, though, is if we want to do this in 25 years, and the Scottish Government wants to adopt our plan and start implementing it, and they want to be done by 2045, then they needed to have started two and a half months ago. We don't have the powers to do everything yet, and that is true, but that's not an excuse to not do what we can do. 
I've mentioned things like doing surveys of housing. We should also be seeing surveys of our land. What can the land be used for? We should be seeing surveys of where our energy sources actually are, not just the wind, but also things like solar thermal, geothermal. We need to do as much as we can to make everything as shovel ready as possible by the time those powers are coming. For those of you in the independence movement, that's the challenge, isn't it? Because those powers are coming, aren't they? They're coming soon, aren't they? That we don't have those powers right now shouldn't be an excuse for inaction. Plan for the day when we do have them. And now we get to the point that everybody wants to know about. How much is this going to cost? As far as we know, we are one of the only fully costed Green New Deal plans for any country anywhere in the world. We've estimated that our plan would cost about £170 billion. It's a massive sum on the face of it. If you're balking at that, think about the cost of doing nothing. Think about the cost of letting Falkirk, Inverness and Aberdeen going under, go underwater. Think about all the other problems that will hit us if we don't do anything. We have stated that over the 25 years of the project, we will be borrowing that money and investing it. Um, and we will pay back that money over 50 years, over two generations. We've worked out that that will cost Scotland about £5 billion a year. It's a large sum. It's comparable to other budget lines that you'll see in reports like JERS. It's about twice what we spend on defence, for example. The direct impact of doing the Great Green New Deal will bring in, we've modelled, around £4 billion extra in tax revenue every year, plus about the same in revenue from all the nationalised industries, like the Nationalised Energy Company, National Public Transport Company. And then there will be savings that are less hard to calculate, although they will be tangible. Savings in terms of health benefits, for instance. Even without the climate emergency, we should be doing this. We should be doing this even if we don't need to, because we do need to, really. Doing nothing is bad economics. One of the things we're sometimes told about the Green New Deal is that it will be a plan of sacrifice and privation. We've looked at what Scotland would need to sacrifice if we implemented a Green New Deal. We'll have to sacrifice quite a lot. We have to sacrifice the pollution that comes from burning all those fossil fuels. We have to sacrifice our cold and drafty homes and our unaffordable energy bills. We have to sacrifice the morning commuter traffic jam, an evening one. We have to sacrifice an economy that is making us miserable. Because remember, capitalism isn't selling you the joy of owning a new thing. It's selling you the fear of not owning it when someone else does. We we'll have to sacrifice our reputation of the ones who wrecked this place as we develop the solutions to clean it all up. I contend that these are good sacrifices to make. Anyone who thinks otherwise, then please come and make your case. So, the climate emergency isn't just about the climate. It's about our planet, it's about our country, it's about our community, it is about our common home at every level. This was just a taster of Commonweal's Common Home Plan. There's more in the books. We have two books. We've got a larger technical read in the form of the, the, the green book you're seeing in the slide there, and we've got a slightly easier to read, much more graphic heavy version uh, in the orange book you can also see. There's more chapters in that uh, on things like air and sea transport, trade, jobs, how we retrain people to take up those jobs. Highly encourage anyone to go to our shop and buy the book, or you can download the, the green book as an ebook for free off our policy library. Send in your comments, send in your, your ideas of how we can do it faster. What I want to say is once we've got started with all this, once we're done, you'll be looking back at Scotland and think, why did we not do this sooner? Very finally, come and visit our website, commonweal.scot. I should say that Commonweal as an organisation... We are entirely funded by folk like yourselves giving us a five or a ten or a month. This is how we sustain all of these projects that we've produced. We don't have government money. We don't have big fundraising donors. We don't have billionaire philanthropists throwing money at us. We don't even have adverts on the website. We are entirely supported by folk like yourself. So go onto our website, read the policy papers, read the plans, go onto our shop and buy the plans. We have those two books. We have other books on how we can start a new independent country. We've got a, an atlas of opportunity if you want to see where the resources of Scotland actually are. 
please buy them, give them to your friends, give them to your family. And if you want to support us, if you enjoy what we're doing, if you think what we're doing is value and you want to see us produce more of it, then please sign up as a regular supporter. Go to our donate page and give us a tenner a month or whatever you can afford. Thank you for listening to what hopefully will be the first in a series of these video presentations. I, If you found this valuable, let me know. And if there's demand for this, then I will record all of the other presentations that I often give around the country and I'll be putting them up online so that they can be shared around places and maybe we'll have another one of these virtual conferences very soon. Thank you.